right, so this morning we've come to the end of our verse-by-verse study of the second, Paul's second letter to the Thessalonian church. And we're going to be covering chapter 3, verses 6 through 18. And I've titled today's message, Freeloaders Be Warned, or a warning to freeloaders. Another word for freeloaders I wanted to use is moochers. If you're familiar with the word, um, the term, and as we go through this study, you'll, you'll understand um, the meaning behind the title. Um, now, back in the previous chapter, chapter 2, Paul had addressed and corrected some of the doctrinal fallacies, some of the doctrinal errors that were going around the church there in Thessalonica, in, in, in Thessalonica I was confusing believers and uh, confusing the, Lord, the believers about the Lord's return. You see, because of intense trials and persecutions that they were experiencing, many of those believers were experiencing, some of the Thessalonian Christians were being led to believe that that day, that day of the Lord was imminent. It was going to happen at any moment. And, or some were even saying that it passed them by. But for the most part, the word was going around that the Lord, the day of the Lord was, was happening. It could happen at any moment, which is true. But the problem was that many of them simply gave up on their responsibilities. They quit their jobs, they quit providing for their families, for themselves, and just began to ask people. They began to ask the church, those that were still working, those the Christ, other their Christian brothers and sisters to meet their financial needs, even though they were more than capable of working and making a living themselves. And so they were freeloading. They were mooching all because while they were being idle, while they were just waiting, sitting there and waiting. And so aware of the damage that this was causing the church, Paul, here in this section we're going to be covering, will proceed to give clear instructions to those believers, to the church there, and how to deal with these brethren, with such brethren. In the first part of our passage that we're going to be reading, Paul will elaborate that the performance of work to the best of one's ability is a vital part of living out one's faith. And then he'll conclude this letter with his typical benediction that begins with the blessing of peace and then ends with a blessing of grace. This passage show you many things and some things may be sensitive to some but again it, if it's convicting then it's something that you want to come to the Lord about I hope that this message just really shows you some things that really speaks to you and and shows you the importance of being a contributing member as much as you possibly can to not just society, but to the church. It's the ethical and moral thing to do as a Christian. And so, before we get into God's Word, we're going to be the first part of our reading. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless us and speak to us this morning. Heavenly Father, it's such a great time of worship, and, and thank you for all you've done in our lives. Thank you for 
showering us every single day with your blessings. As difficult as it may be, as hard as it may be at times, Lord, to, to, to get up and climb out of bed, Lord, we know that you're with us. We know that you give us the strength every day to keep us going. And while we're still, while you still have, have given us breath in our lungs, and I just want to glorify you for just being so good to us and merciful and giving us the grace that definitely didn't deserve. So now speak to us as we conclude this letter, Lord. Um, Tell us what it is that we need to know. Speak to us as individuals and speak to us as a church. Teach us what we need to know. Open our eyes and ears. May your word be deeply implanted into our hearts. It may grow so it may bear fruit. I want to hear from you. Now, fill this room with your spirit, Lord, and, and everyone here just focus on what you have to say now. Pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, Second Thessalonians chapter 3, and we're going to be now picking up in verse 6 of Second Thessalonians chapter 3. And the Word of God says, Now we command you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from every brother or sister who is idle and does not live according to traditions received from us. For you yourselves know how you should imitate us. We were not idle among you. We did not eat anyone's food free of charge. Instead, we labored and toiled working night and day so that we would not be a burden to any of you. It is not that we don't have a right to support, but we did it to make ourselves an example to you so you would imitate us. In fact, when we were with you, this is what we commanded you. If anyone isn't willing to work, he should not eat. For we hear that there are some among you who are idle. They are not busy, but busybodies. Now, we command and exhort such people by the Lord Jesus Christ to work quietly and provide for themselves. But as for you, brothers and sisters, do not grow weary in doing good. In verses 6 through 10, we see Paul informing his readers how to treat the disorderly among them. See, that, the, that the, a minority of the church members were misbehaving seems clear in Paul's admonished, in, in that Paul admonished his readers uh, generally to discipline the erring brethren. The seriousness of the charge is seen in Paul's appeal to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. On behalf of everything that, is, that Jesus Christ is, they should do as Paul said. And as you can see, this, he says, is a command. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. Back in his first letter, in chapter 5, verse 14, Paul had already told the church the same thing, that he wrote the same thing to the church earlier. He told them, warn those who are idle. Tell them, warn them. Well, apparently this warning it wasn't heeded. So now Paul had to now get deeper and had to prescribe harsher discipline. See, second-degree discipline involved the orderly separating of themselves 
from the lazy and the disorderly. This, have, this may have included excluding them from the life and meetings of the church. This lack of contact would illustrate in a graphic way the spiritual gap that the behavior of the unruly had created. The offense, what was the offense? Idleness. Deliberately loafing, which led to some, inter- to some to interfere in the work of others. And again, to expect others to provide for their needs. And this behavior was in direct disobedience, in contradiction to what they had, these apostles, these uh, Paul and his companions, to what they had taught them while he was with them in teaching them in uh, Thessalonica. Paul then justified his, this command with the example that the missionaries, again, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, had given them when he was with them. In his first letter, Paul had commended the church for following his example. But when it came to working, when it came to providing and contributing, there were some who were not following it. Quite clearly, Paul regarded the apostles' example as an authoritative model for their converts. He tells them they were to imitate their behavior as well as to believe teaching. See, Paul and his associates were never lazy loafers. He basically says there in verse 8 that they didn't mooch, that they didn't freeload. Now, again, keep in mind that Paul wasn't saying that they never accepted a gift or a meal from others, but that they were self-supporting. They earned the bread they ate. In fact, they worked long and hard as to not be a financial burden to any of the Thessalonians. Paul then adds that he and his companions lived in this way to give their converts, those who had accepted Jesus through their testimony, an example of what it means to sacrifice for the good of others. See, they had every right. They had every right to receive physical help for spiritual ministry. They had every right to receive financial help, support for their spiritual ministry. But they chose to forego this right in order to teach the importance of self-sacrificing love and industry. This is something that I follow right now and I believe in. As many of you have heard me say that I don't take a single penny from the church. My wife and I, we both work. And so everything that comes in, it goes to pay the bills, the rent, you know, to have maybe guest speakers here um, for other things, other ministry purposes to keep the lights on. But even though, again, I have every right to receive some kind of financial support and it's biblical, I don't. I choose not to. Again, to be an example right now. And who, I can't say later on that I won't or it, it may not happen. It would have to be a decision that would come from the leadership. But in this season, for now, it's not really necessary for me. 
And again, I just want to be, in order to show you, in order to show others too that you can share the word, you can preach the word and not to make, be, get rich off of it. The gospel message is a free message. It's a gift from God. And I don't ever want to be known as someone that shares this message for a price. That's why we don't pass a basket around. That's why I don't push giving. I don't have telethons, phonathons. You know, I want, we want you to give out of the goodness of your heart, out of just out of joy, not out of, out of obligation. But again, I understand what Paul is saying here, and I don't. I also don't want to be a burden to anyone. Now, um, his point here, and this is important to point out, was that able-bodied believers, those who could work, those who could labor, shouldn't expect others to take care of them, but ought to support themselves if possible. And let me add this, there's a lot of people in the church who are able to work, who are able to, you know, are physically can work, but they don't because they're expecting free handouts from the church. There's a lot of churches out there that, you know, I, that receive a lot of help from volunteers. They get a lot of help from volunteers, and volunteers are, are, are man, it's, it's a gift. It's a blessing. But as volunteers, you know, you need to go out also and work and support yourself. You go out and get a job, and pay, if you're spending more time volunteering and not getting paid for it, it's a problem there. You pay your bills. You pay your rent, you need to eat. You shouldn't expect the church to provide for every single one of your financial needs. If you're able to work, go out and work. He explains, Paul explains in verse 10, that the missionaries, him and his companions, had taught the Thessalonians to be industrials as well as giving them a good example. He wanted no one to forget exactly what the, uh, what the apostles had said. It was a firm rule of Christian conduct. They either quoted it verbatim here or summarized, or he summarized his previous teaching into a single, single simple precept. The individuals, there were thinking of, of those individuals that they were talking about or talking to were those who could not work, but those who would not work. Again, those are the people that he had in mind here. Those who, not, that weren't those who could not work, but those who would not work. They were not to be supported by other Christians out of a sense of charity. The loving thing to do for these drones was to let them go hungry so that they would be forced to do what is right and go to work. The point is, no Christian who is able but unwilling to work should be maintained by others who labor on his behalf. Let me also add this. Now, I know and I've been a part of churches that have helped people get on their feet, especially after they've come out of prison or jails, moved into new towns or have had a hard time getting a job. But there have always been conditions behind that help. Come to Wednesday night Bible study. You know, help us clean the church. You know, just, there was, 
It wasn't just free handouts, especially if they were able to, to help out. Now, I, I agree, and hopefully one day we'll be able to help those who are in need. But we also know we don't want to do it for forever. On a long-term basis, it ought to be temporary. Whether it be financial support, whether it's getting a ride to and from church, as leaders, as a, past, as a pastor here, I want to see that these people are also making an effort, that are just expecting things, that they're willing to give and share. Even if they have to take a bus, two buses, if they really want to be here, they'll be here. So again, we're not, as Christians, we're not, uh, we should be, um, no Christian is, who is able but unwilling to work should be maintained by others who labor on his behalf. Well, after informing them how to treat the disorderly among them and to follow their example, that, uh, follow the example that he and his companions displayed while they were with them, Paul goes on now to focus on a specific problem again, in the church. He does this in verses 11 through 13 by giving some commands to the idol. See, Silvanus, Timothy, and Paul had heard more than once that some of the church weren't working to support themselves. Paul tells them in the end, at the end of verse 11 that they were not busy, but busybodies. In the New Living Translation, the end of verse 11 puts it like this. Refusing to work and meddling, meddling in other people's business. See, in other words, instead of tending to their own business of earning a living, they were meddling in the business of others. So in verse 12, Paul and his companions gave those in this category both a command and an exhortation on behalf of their union with Christ, which was basically this, with calm and sober minds, and in view of what had been written concerning the day of the Lord, they should work quietly and provide for themselves. By doing this, they would earn their own bread and not sponge or mooch or freeload off of others. Now, this is something that Paul had already told them back in his first letter in chapter 4, verse 11. But because some of them had disobeyed, again, he gave them a sterner command. Turning to the faithful major majority, Paul urged in verse 13, continuation in doing what they, were, what they knew to be right, regardless of the leeching, of the disobedient. When other Christians take easy paths of irresponsibility and seem to prosper in them, it's easy to get discouraged and be tempted to join them. And I know that feeling. Maybe you've had that feeling too. I'll give you another example. I mean, I've seen churches that have either started the same time we did or started after we did and they have all these programs and how to make money and how to bring people in to the church and getting buildings and seeing hundreds and you know growth exponential growth it seems like we kind of just going through the motions. It seems like we're just kind of going through, you know, the same amount of, of, of people and nothing has really changed. But again, it's easy to get discouraged and say, you know what, I need to do what they're doing. I need to get in some kind of program. I need to have, you know, join some kind of, go to some conference about how to get more people into the door, how to make, how to bring the, 
you know, church more money, you know, maybe how to be a celebrity pastor, you know, how to look good, dress good, talk good, you know, it, it, it gets easy to have those ideas start to you know, go through the mind. Then I go back and I remember that it's not what it's all about. That's not what it's all about. It's all about, again, Jesus and sharing the message, sharing the gospel, sharing what God has given me, what God is saying in His Word to those that are here, to those that are watching. And I'm not here to make a name for myself. I'm here to make a name for Jesus, to glorify His name, to bring His name up, to lead people to the cross. I was asked this past week, what are my three priorities in life? And I answered, number one is to draw near to the Lord. Number two is to bring people to the cross. And number three is to love my wife and to show her I love her and for her to know that I love her. I'm sorry if you're number three, honey, but I uh, hope you understand. Point being, again, it's what I'm called to do. And I'm going to do it until the Lord calls me to something else. I can't breathe anymore until he calls me home. But this is what I'm going to do. Regardless if there's 5, 10, 20 people here, whether it's just me and the camera, you know, I'm going to continue to do what he's called me to do. Again, though one may tire in doing what is right, he should never tire of doing what is right. Now, in addressing the diligent as brothers and the idle as such people, Paul implied that those who disobeyed this word from God were separating themselves by their behavior. Well, after this, in verse 14, he states with even stronger language how the rest of the church should relate to the idol if they refuse to repent. Having been warned twice, again in his first letter in chapter 4 and now here in verse 14, a disobedient person must be given special treatment if he failed to repent. You see, Paul regarded his writings as authoritative for the church. They were to be obeyed because he was an apostle and his inspired words were the word of God. The idle one were to be identified as such by members of the church and placed in a distinct category as disobedient. It seems to be what each faithful brother should do individual, individually. It seems, I'm sorry, let me repeat that. This seems to be what each faithful brother should do individually. No mention is made of public identification and discipline in the church. The faithful were not to have social contact with an idle person until he repented. The purpose of this social ostracism was to make the offender feel ashamed of himself or herself so that they would repent. The design of divine discipline is always, is always to produce repentance, not division. You see, social pressures can be effective in helping an erring person come to his or her senses. This is exactly what Paul advocated in this, in this case. Ostracism from the body of believers should help such a person be ashamed and feel his separation from fellowship with the head of the body, Jesus Christ. And so concerned that the Thessalonians might overdo, go overboard in this discipline, Paul quickly urged them to treat the offender 
as a brother, as a sister, and not as an enemy. An occasion for discipline should not become an occasion for disobedience by those exercising the discipline. They weren't to think of the offender as personally antagonistic toward them, nor were they to feel hostile toward them. Their objective relationship to them as a brother in Christ, as a sister in Christ, should govern their feelings and actions rather than subjective feelings that might be aroused by his idleness. They were to warn him. They were to warn him, not denounce him. Whereas they were to have no social contact with him, they were not to break off all contact. They were patiently to admonish that disobedient believer to forsake the error of their ways. Now here again, he's speaking of the idol. But in Scripture, there are various levels of church discipline that must be distinguished. In Matthew 18 and in Philippians chapter 4, one such dis- discipline is, well, that, talk, that talks about there is the personal differences between Christians. For brother or sister sins against me, either deliberately or unknowingly, I should go to that person and seek to get the matter settled. Only if the person refuses to settle the matter should I bring anyone else in. And the problem mustn't go to the church family, to the entire church family, until every other means has been exhausted. Some of the biggest problems in many churches are this type of problem. Personal differences between between Christians, between believers. The big mistake Christians make when another believer wrongs them is in telling the pastor or other members and not going to the person directly. Another mistake is trying to win an argument instead of trying to win the sinning brother or sister. If you're ever offended here, if you've ever been wronged here, and you're coming to me about it, I'm going to hear you out. But as any parent, I'm going to say, solve it. Take care of it. Talk to that person. They may not even know that they offended you. They may not even know that they've wronged you. Tell them. If they recognize it, they see it, if they're really humble and not prideful, not dictated by their pride, they're going to ask for forgiveness. And then that's the next step is yours. Will you forgive them? But yeah, I've been to churches where people have wronged others and it just causes problems and you know, it causes issues between brothers and sisters, and when it easily could have just been resolved by talking to that person and say, you know what, I didn't agree with what you said. I thought the way you looked at me, you talked to me, was degrading, offensive, whatever it may be. And talk it out. All that could be resolved. A lot of issues could have been resolved by just talking it out, praying together. Okay, another problem in the church that requires church discipline is, could require church discipline, is doctrinal error. When someone teaches, is teaching the wrong thing. 
error, doctrinal error. In this case, leaders, the pastor, must determine, first of all, why the person is teaching wrong doctrine. Perhaps it's because of ignorance and lack of biblical knowledge. In that case, patiently, we must patiently teach him or her the truth. Now, if he persists, then it must be rebuked. Paul had to do this to Peter, remember? And he talked about it in Galatians chapter 2. Now, if the error continues, avoid them, according to Romans chapter 16, and then separate yourselves from him or her. Now, another one is when a believer is overtaken by, by sin. And that is talked about in Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Even the great, the great Apostle Peter denied the Lord. And David yielded to lust and committed adultery. When a Christian is caught in known sin, the spiritual members of the church must seek to restore him with, this is important, with gentleness and love. Maybe some of you have been in churches or at churches where that hasn't been done right away. First offense is quick. There's harshness. There's no love. There's no gentleness. The rod is quickly taken out and they're, beat, they're beaten severely with it. A Christian is caught in sin. As believers, we must seek to restore with gentleness and love. The word restore here means to set a broken bone. And that takes tenderness and patience. Too often the church quickly passes judgment on a believer who has sinned and the damage done causes problems for years to come. It damages that person's view of the church of Christians and it doesn't heal the body. It doesn't do anything for the body. They're just looking for the next person that's going to make the same offense. In Titus chapter 3, another one is a repeating troublemaker. The word there in, in Titus chapter 3 verse 10, the word divisive refers to a proud attitude of one who gets people to take sides in the church. This, of course, leads to disunity, and it leads to cliques in the local church. Have you ever seen that in your previous churches because of divisive people, cliques and disunity? That's what it causes, a divisive person. There's hardly a church that doesn't have parties for or against anything. The pastor, the building program, the kind of music, the kind of decorations, the color of the walls. It's always something. Usually these divisive people, they like to be important. They want a following. Only they have deep emotional problems that Satan can use to create spiritual problems in the church. Perhaps they're frustrated at home or on the job. Perhaps they have in the past been hurt by some pastor or church. These divisive people should be given two, two official warnings. If they repeat their sin, of dividing the church, they should be given a third warning and rejected. Here's what Titus chapter 3, verses 10 and 11 says. If people, and I'm reading this from the New Living Translation, if people are causing division among you, give a first and second warning. After that, have nothing to do with them. 
For people like that have churned away from the truth and their own sins condemn them. It's my own belief, my own convictions that such people should not hold office, should not hold, I'm sorry, not office, but leadership positions in the church. I also believe that if they leave the church and huff, huffing and puffing, disgruntled, they should be restored to fellowship only twice. But by the third time, see you later, you're out. You're just going to keep doing it and keep doing it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, another one that requires discipline is open, immorality. And this is a big one. Leaders, pastors that have morally failed. The church must never mourn over the sinner. The same word there is used for mourning over the dead. Um, they should seek, again, to bring him into repentance. If he refuses, the church collectively should dismiss him. If he repents, he must be forgiven and restored to fellowship Fellowship in the church. They're leaders. They've disqualified themselves. If I've if I ever morally disqualify myself, if I ever do anything that is morally wrong, then I've disqualified myself from being up here. I will... I'd have to step down. Same with, goes to it with any leader here. Anyone that teaches the Bible, anyone that teaches the Word of God. But again, they'll still be part of the fellowship. They just can't hold those leadership positions. Now, in the case of the lazy, sense, lazy saints, which we're talking about here, which the passage is talking about here, um, Paul told the believers to exhort them, warn them, and if they didn't repent, to withdraw intimate fellowship with them. This probably meant that believers weren't permitted to share the Lord's Supper, communion, and the church members shouldn't invite them over to their house. Now keep in mind that verse 14 doesn't apply to every case of discipline. Keep that in mind. It doesn't apply to every case of discipline. It applies only to the matter of saints not working for a living. Able-bodied saints not, a, not working for a living. Church, persistent and uncorrected sin not only spreads like gangrene within the church, but results in a bad witness to the outside world. Such sins are compounded when the offender repeatedly doesn't respond to church discipline. In reality, there's only one ultimate sin that, that warrants excommunication, namely intractable refusal to respond to the loving correction of church leaders. If you're being corrected, if you're being disciplined, and you refuse, you're just fighting, fighting and fighting, saying, no, I didn't do anything wrong. Comes a point where we say, you know what? Can't have you here anymore. I've, hopefully, I'll never have to do that here. But, I, you know, every church, I guess, has had something like that, something, something like that happen. The um, problem is if the church pays no attention to such, thin, so, to such sins, it will be disastrous. They will have a disastrous effect on the reputation of the unbel effect on its reputation among the unbelieving culture. And it's just, again, continue, it's just going to damage the, the 
the view that outsiders have of the church. And maybe, maybe again, there's a lot of, maybe you guys see news reports, articles on what others are saying when pastors are fallen. Oh yeah, that's, you know, that's a pastor. That's supposed to be representing Christ. Yeah, Christians are a bunch of fools. Well, this develops an earlier theme that Christians are to live in such a way that they win the respect of outsiders and that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored. The church, my friends, must take action on these kinds of situations. Not only that, not only that the sinner might repent, but because the honor of God and His Word is at stake. All right. Now let me cover the last couple verses of chapter 3. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 16. May the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. I, Paul, am writing this greeting with my own hand, which is, a, which is the authenticating mark in every letter. This is how I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Verse 16 has been called a peaceful close to a stormy epistle, a stormy letter. In it, Paul prays that the suffering saints in Thessalonica may know the peace of the Lord of peace at all times and in every way. You see, the Christian isn't dependent on anything in this world for their serenity. Think about that. As a Christian, as a believer, you're not dependent on anything in this world for your serenity. Your, surrender, your serenity, your peace is entirely based, is entirely on the person and work of the Lord Jesus. There isn't a single believer that can say, I'm not able to obey God's word and go to work because God has made every provision for us to obey him. Not, again, let me repeat that. Not a single believer can say, I am not able to obey God's word and go to work. Because again, God has made every provision for us to obey Him. Church, He is our Lord of peace. If He is the Lord of our lives, then we will have peace in our own hearts. And we will help to encourage peace in our church fellowship. If there's trouble in the church, it's because there's trouble in somebody's heart. If Christ is Lord, then there is peace in the heart. Christ is really your Lord. If you really surrendered your heart to Him, then there will be peace will be peace in the heart, in your heart, in the heart of a believer. If there is war in the heart, then Jesus Christ isn't Lord. Now, not only does God's peace enable us to obey Him, but so does His presence. Paul writes, the Lord be with you all. In Matthew 28 and Hebrews 13, we're promised that He never leaves us or forsakes us. He is with us to the end of the age. And so as He does with many of His letters, Paul, in verse 17, signs this letter and follows it up in the last verse with the same words that, again, would have authenticated that it came from Him. But it's that final verse that Paul also reminds us of something just as important as God's peace. 
His grace. Let me read that verse again, that last verse. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Church, if we depend on the grace of God, we can do His will to the glory of God. We're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, My grace is sufficient for you. Those of you who have served, been in the military, probably understand this. The soldier who was out of rank and disobedient of the Lord's command proves that he isn't surrendered to his master. church. Problems are individual problems, and they must be solved individually. God wants order in the church. He says so in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40. Everything is to be done decently and in order. And so ask yourself, ask yourself this question. Are you part of the peace of the church? We're part of a war in the church. Are you advocating for peace? Are you one that brings people together and sharing burdens? And, or are you causing division? Are you purposely going out there to cause problems, and divisions? If that's you, you know, I'd rather you watch online and not be here because again I once I recognize it once I will see it I will say something I'm not one to sugarcoat or tippy toe or whatever around uh, these serious issues if I see a problem I will address it or if anybody sees a problem and they talk to me about it then I will pay attention and look at it pay attention to that problem and but eventually it would have to be addressed. Ask yourself, are you part of the peace, part of the war in the church? So let's do what Joshua did and fall at the feet of the captain of the host of hosts, that he might enable us to win the victory and fulfill his purposes for his people. This concludes this second letter of that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. And there's a lot in this. There was some, some harshness, some, you know, again, exhortation, some, some uh, encouragement. But he wrote all this because he loved this church. He planted this church. He cared for them and as a father would to a child. And what is that? This? Oh, I don't know. I don't know why he's doing this. But let me quickly finish and say, you know, it's been great covering this letter, and you know, there are many things that we've, that I've learned personally, and hopefully you've learned as well. Go through it again, study it. Maybe the Lord will re reveal new truths here. As we close, and as I close now, if you are watching this and you now recognize your need to be saved from your sins, to be forgiven of all your sins, I want to lead you to the cross. I want to lead you to Jesus so that He may forgive you of all your sins. He died on the cross to forgive you all of them, forgive all your sins. All you have to do is come. Come as you are and just lay those sins at His feet. He wants to forgive you. He died to forgive you. So if that's what you'd like to do, you want to be forgiven of all your sins and know that when you breathe your last and you come face to face with God that he will find you worthy and righteous.
because now the blood of Jesus, you've been forgiven by the blood of his son. Well, that's what you like, then I'm going to I'm going to lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus as your Lord, Lord and Savior. So wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head and pray this with all sincerity. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. And I'll turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Now fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you prayed that, reach out to us. If you need help in your next steps of Christian walk, we can help do that. We can help you with that. The celebration in heaven going on right now. We want to know about it. So uh, contact us through our website or, you know, social media. We want to hear from you. Be blessed. Rejoice in the Lord. Bless others. Share the gospel with your words and actions this week. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.